Do you believe free will exists? I don't believe free, libertarian free will exists. I'm a compatibilist and a la Dan Dennett, but uh, I, I, think, I think libertarian free will doesn't exist. And did you freely come to believe that? Un under the compatibilist version of free will, uh, I may or may not have. It appears that I was able to assess things as a thinking agent, um, and that's good enough. Uh, it's, so what, what Dennett basically argues for is the varieties of free will worth wanting. I have the freest will I can imagine. Libertarian free will tends to go further, implying that the, the decider essentially uh, is not bound by constraints. So do you believe that, that God has already predetermined my belief system. Yes. So then how can I be held responsible or accountable for because my belief system? Because you do, you do freely. I do it freely, but yes. it's been... So it's been... But you said it's been predestined by right. God. Your free choices have been predestined by God. That's no problem. Hold on. Sigh. So, okay. Sigh. Are you, Eric, do you believe have, that? Are you so, saying that that's illogical? Are you saying that's illogical? I'm going to answer you, but let me finish my answer. Right. Yes, it's illogical because you just said it is predestined right. free choices. Right. That's an oxymoron. Show me the logical contradiction. Because if my choices are predestined, they're not being freely made. I made a response video about this section of the debate. I explained how David Smulley seems to have no clue that his own worldview promotes the idea that he's classifying as an oxymoron. If you haven't watched that video yet, Click here and make sure you watch that one first. Of course, I'm not surprised at his reaction because common sense tells us that determinism and freedom are not compatible. But as you can see, there are people on both sides of the debate who have deceived themselves into believing that compatibilism is true. In other words, freedom and determinism are compatible. While atheists cannot account for any other type of free will other than compatibilism, which is really no free will at all, the theists can, however, easily account for libertarian free will, which is also known as contracausal free will. Contracausal free will is the power to do something without being fully caused to do it. This is what most people mean by free will. Contracausal free will is distinct from what you might call caused free will which is the type of free will compatibilists like Matt Dullahunty and Saiten Brugenkate accept. Those with caused free will are able to do what they want, but this doesn't mean that their actions are somehow free from causal determination, which means they are not able to do otherwise. What you want, and therefore how you act, is totally determined by the causal chain of past events. If nature is all there is, then there is no room for contracausal free will, because everything would be quote-unquote natural from the way we think in order to form our beliefs to the way we act based on our beliefs. Everything we do is ultimately caused by nature. We do it freely in the sense that nobody is forcing us to do it, but we can't help not doing what we do. It is ironic that compatibilists hold people responsible for anything, because the very concept of responsibility presupposes the existence of contracausal free will. In other words, if someone is not able to do otherwise, then they are not responsible for what they do, because they are not able to respond to correction of any kind, which is where the very word response, able, comes from, able to respond. On the other hand, if God has predetermined our choices, then we cannot do otherwise, and logically speaking, the idea of God holding us responsible would be irrational and absurd, as David Smulley rightly said. But of course, both naturalists and Calvinists seem to be blinded by these facts and tend to hold people responsible or able to respond, which goes against their belief system. This is, of course, a major inconsistency that shows that compatibilists are suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. Let's watch more of the debate between Eric Hernandez and Matt Delahunty, and then I will try to explain what compatibilists like Matt and Sai are missing. 
let's say a mad scientist, for whatever reason, has put some kind of electrode in my arm to make me punch the person in front of me. Now, I may actually want to punch whatever person that's in front of me. Sure. So even if, so even though I did it, I still could not have refrained from doing it. So even on compatibilism, there's still there's still no is there is still no free will that is at least necessary to make this debate meaningful. Well, so on compatibilism, my my best example of how compatibles view free will, or at least I do. I can't speak for all of them, uh, or maybe I can. Um, is it's about recognizing a difference between two things. For example, uh, you could get up and walk out the door right now. Or somebody could pick you up and drag you out the door. There's a difference between those two scenarios and whether or not you're, you have libertarian free will isn't even relevant to those. Compatibilism is just identifying that there's a difference between actions taken by this thinking agent and well, actions unduly influenced or, mo or uh, directed by another thing. Well, no, I, well, I disagree. Um, according to compatibilism, you are already determined to do something, but you can't will to do anything else. And, and that's the, the very point of free will. It's called dual ability. You have to be able to either at least will to do it or refrain from willing. So, for example, even if someone did drag me out, I could still will to not be dragged out. So libertarian freedom, or any kind of freedom, all differ on the point, do you have the ability to at least refrain from willing or willing? So if I, let me just ask it again then, do you think that everybody here could have not come to this debate tonight no. without anything else being different? Without anything else being different? Right. Absolutely not, under libertarian free will or anything. If nothing else was different, then whether they willed it or not, they were going to come. So they were determined to come here? If everything was the same? Sure. Okay, so then you do. So then, you, what you just said is is something you were determined to say. You couldn't have said it otherwise, or even believed it otherwise, which means you have no way to prove whether your beliefs are true or false. Because no matter what, you're determined to believe them. You you would admit that. I have plenty of ways to prove whether or not my beliefs are consistent with reality, which is the only thing that matters. Well, not if you're determined. You just you have to believe it. You have no choice. Whether or not I chose to believe it or not is independent from whether or not my beliefs are accurate. Just as you being forced to punch somebody is independent from your will. Well, no, my I belief could be true whether I was destined to believe it or whether I willingly believed it. But, but again, you're, you, but you're assuming my position now. Now you're thinking that you could see if it's true freely and that you're not determined to believe whether it's true or not. In other words, you have to. No, I'm saying that I believe X is independent from whether or not X is true. Right, sure. So it doesn't matter whether I was determined to believe X or whether I willingly opted to believe X. That is a separate issue from whether right. or not my belief is true. So then, so what you're admitting exactly what I'm trying to say is that you're going to believe something whether it's true or not. I'm going to believe have whatever to. I believe. That's the way it works. You don't choose your beliefs. Beliefs are not an act of volition. But you're admitting exactly what I'm trying to say is that you're going to believe something whether it's true or not. I'm going to believe whatever I believe. That's the way it works. You don't choose your beliefs. Beliefs are not an act of volition. You don't choose your beliefs. Beliefs are not an act of volition. You're admitting exactly what I'm trying to say is that you're going to believe something whether it's true or not. I'm going to believe whatever to. I believe. That's the way it works. You don't apology. choose your beliefs. Beliefs are not an act of volition. You don't apology. choose your beliefs. Beliefs are not an act of volition. This is perhaps the climax of this discussion, because Matt Dillahunty admits that compatibilism fails to make any arguments meaningful. It's a self-defeating position to argue from that fails to make sense of rationality and reduces everything to absurdity. Matt says that we don't choose our beliefs. If we don't choose our beliefs, then what is the point of arguing or thinking? A compatibilist will say that the point of arguing or thinking is that they can be used as the means by which our beliefs will change. But the right answer would be that we can't help it and our arguments and our thoughts are also already predetermined, which reduces rationality to absurdity. And as a result, our arguments and our thoughts become futile and meaningless. Therefore, it is my judgment that a compatibilist who refuses to acknowledge the logical conclusion that follows from his version of free will is obviously suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. This is why most people such as David Smully, who have never thought about this topic, will immediately call the contradiction out and will label compatibilism as an oxymoron. Are you responsible for the beliefs that you hold? Yes. So then you freely chose to believe it, you weren't determined to. 
And, and I don't I'm responsible in the sense that we hold me responsible. This is the way we operate. Um, I don't know, you might have been talking about a different responsibility, but... In other words, do, do you think, well, and then we go in a circle, so let me just try it again. Can I ever act contrary to my desires? Can you ever act contrary to your desires? No. And did you feel a desire to say that, or were you just determined to say that? I don't, I don't know that I felt a desire, but I certainly didn't act in contradiction to a desire. What Matt Dillahunty is missing here is that the word responsible comes from response and able or ability, which technically means the ability to respond or able to respond. If Matt's version of free will is true, then the very concept of responsibility falls apart, but compatibilists seem to have their own definition of words, and when it comes to responsibility, their definition of responsibility is not really responsibility at all, since given compatibilism, all thinking agents are not able to respond, but only those who are predetermined to respond are able to respond. And therefore, holding those who do not respond would be irrational, because given compatibilism, those who do not respond are not able to respond. Right, and, and, and I don't want to keep going in a circle. My point is, and, and I think you actually agree with me here, is that no matter what, this debate would technically be pointless because no matter what either you or I say, everybody here was determined to be here, and whatever we say, they're going to believe regardless of what we say because of no. prior actions that happened. No, where do you, you get regardless? Even if it's all determined, maybe they will change their mind it's determined that they will change their mind based on what I said or based on what you said. But that's not what There's I said. nothing about free will that says you get to ignore every action. It's the actions that matter. It's the interactions that if anything dictates what you believe or what you accept, it is the interactions. But that, has, that is completely irrelevant. So what I'm saying is that in order for them to make a free decision, they can't be determined. Because for example, I'm not convinced they made a free decision. I came here to debate the soul, not free will. What, well, the soul has to do with free will. If there's no soul, there's no but free will. But I don't will. believe there's a soul, and simply asserting that we do have free will doesn't still get you to a soul, because there's no demonstration that even if we have free will, that this means there's a soul. Let, let's try a demonstration. Uh, if you're here today, and you don't believe in free will, could you please freely raise your hand? Oh, you do that. I had a now if you, you notice the way I worded that I don't I don't think you caught that I said if you don't believe in free will please freely raise your hand and some people actually did that that alone would prove that at least say that there's some type of free will nothing determined them no it wouldn't how would it not so that's stimulus response you haven't demonstrated that it was free will how did I not I said if you freely believe to raise your hand how is that so, so they were determined to, I could to program a computer to respond to if you freely believe you have free will turn the screen white and tell the computer that and it would do that it doesn't but, demonstrate it had free will but now you're begging the question you're actually giving me an example where there is no free will and that's the very question I don't know that there's not free will there yet I'm just saying that this particular example demonstrates the problem with your example you're assuming that an, a response to an action Necessi necessarily means there's free will, and I just gave you a counterexample that doesn't require free will, which no, is, no. is a defeater for your Cause, example. Because that counterexample begs the question. That's the very thing that we're trying to ask. Well, you, okay. No, it doesn't beg the question. It's a counterexample. It's saying this doesn't have free will and could still do what you just said was required free will. If you say right, this right. response requires free will, and I show you an example where that response doesn't require free will, that's not question begging. It's pointing out how you're wrong. No, not at all, because... Uh, so it's, it's his question, sorry. Okay, well, let, let's talk about others. First of all, I don't agree with you. If, if someone freely choose, if I freely choose to raise my hand... How'd you know that you did? Oh, sorry, your questions. Okay, no problem. Now, now okay, well, let's, let's talk about desires. Although Matt is right in saying that Eric's stimulus response does not prove that we have contracausal free will, he's missing the point that Eric's stimulus response demonstrated a contradictory behavior of someone in the audience who happens to be a compatibilist. This contradictory behavior can also be seen in how compatibilists tend to hold everyone responsible and expect everyone to quote-unquote understand their arguments and respond to them, while given their worldview, not everyone is able to do so. Not only that, demanding proof for what is self-evident and its denial reduces rationality to absurdity is another behavior that shows that compatibilists are suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. This, of course, does not only apply to atheists, such as Matt Dillahunty, but also to theists, such as Seit and Bugenkate, who is a staunch proponent of Calvinism. 
I can go against my desires because I can have every desire in the world to want to lose weight and get in better shape, and I have a desire to eat a cookie, but I can choose to refrain from that. Secondly, if I have conflicting desires, it is literally up to me to which desire I choose. You know, a lot of people wake up in the morning, you got to go to the bathroom, but you don't get, want, want to get out of bed. You have to choose between one of those two conflicting desires. So, and what I said earlier, if there is no free will, and even if determinism is true, what you're saying is I was caused by prior events to do something, and I could not have done otherwise, then we cannot have rationality. This debate is completely pointless, and no matter what we say, everybody is determined to believe a certain thing. And I would say that the opposite is true. Your claim, your position is that you can violate the causal explanation. You can violate causality. You can willingly violate causality, and that puts an end to rationality. It, in a dynamic universe, it is causality that gets us to rationality, not violations of causality. Matt says that in a dynamic universe, it is causality that gets us to rationality, not violations of causality. Not to mention that this statement presupposes that the origin of everything that exists is rational and trustworthy, and the atheists cannot possibly account for such a trustworthy origin without God, and although the ability to violate causality will not get us to rationality, this does not, however, in any way prove that the existence of contra-causal free will would destroy rationality. On the contrary, it is only through contra-causal free will that we will be able to get to rationality by freely not violating causality. But in the absence of contra-causal free will, not everyone is going to be able to get to rationality, but only those who are predetermined, and therefore, arguments will lose their true meaning, and we won't be able to hold each other accountable or responsible for being irrational. Well, no, not at all, because I can refrain, like I said, from willing, that, and that's that's, and, and it just seems that we disagree. So I'll have to move on. But again, if, um, well, I guess, I guess like, well, we have one minute left, so let's just finish that up. If, if there is no, like, for example, if I have an itch, I can resist a scratch. Yes. And, well, that's free will. So. You said, can you ever act in violation of your desires? And the complexity here is that there are some desires... Can I are, resist my desires? Can you resist your desires? Right. There are some desires that are in conflict. Sure. Okay. You can resist scratching to, to satisfy this desire if there's another desire that you value higher or there's higher value, whether you are free of will or not. Well, I, do, I value eating cookies more than I value losing weight, but I can still refrain from eating a cookie. Yeah, because you because you value losing weight more than you're, you value You're assuming that, but you said you can't look at my brain, so how would you know? So there's two reasons, uh, well, uh, there could be more than two reasons why you would choose losing weight over eating a cookie. One of them could be that you value losing weight more at that particular time, and the other one is that you can violate the causality of the universe and freely choose to deny will. Why would you do that if you didn't value losing weight more? So it's self-defeating. Well, that's question begging, but time's up. Matt says that there are at least two reasons that Eric would choose losing weight over eating a cookie. One of them could be that he values losing weight more at a particular time, and the other one is that he could violate the causality of the universe and freely choose to deny will, and that why would he do that if he values losing weight more, so it's self-defeating. This is of course question begging, as Eric rightly called it out. Firstly, valuing something more does not necessarily mean that we don't have contracausal free will. Secondly, Matt is assuming that under contracausal free will, the causality of the universe values eating a cookie more than losing weight, and that Eric has to violate the causality of the universe if he values losing weight more. Either way, none of these reasons in any way disprove the existence of contracausal free will which is self-evident and necessary in order to make sense of rationality. A reducto ad absurdum is not question begging, but, uh, so I apologize in advance, although we went from a soul to free will, so I don't think this is much of a stretch. Did God create the universe? I believe so. Okay. Did he have a choice in what kind of universe he created? Yes. Did he know what was going to happen? Sure. So God knowingly created the universe in which mm -hmm. I'm an atheist and you're a Christian. Right. Then you don't have free will well, no, any you're, sort. You're assuming God made you an atheist. You're, you, God, again, we're going back God to you're assuming no, that on, there's no free on. will. God could have picked a universe in which I remained a Christian, right? I, I don't know. You said he could have created a different universe. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming among those different ones there are one where somebody, two universes God could have created, somebody ends up going to hell and, and in another universe he could have created they ended up going to heaven. 
I, I have no idea. I'm not God. Okay. I wasn't expecting you to be God. I was just, you know, for the well, sake of I would have to know what God knows. Well, let, let me put it to you like this, because essentially you're asking about fatalism, all right? Uh, that if God knows the future, it's the old question about foreknowledge. If God it's knows the future, it's not just about knowing the future. It's about specifically creating this world from other options. What you're what you're saying, you're you're, you're essentially avoiding this. So, no, I'm, I was gonna, I was about to give you an answer. So, so let me let me just clarify, and then you you can address it. Okay. Here's God. I'm God, and I can create two different universes. Sure. And they may be different. Okay. Either it's the case that I create in this universe, Matt is an atheist who ends up going to hell or whatever sure. he does, and in this universe, Matt's a Christian, either those are two, or in both of those universes, in all possible universes God creates, right. I end up as an atheist, right. in which case we're back to whether or not there's any difference in the universe no. God creates. Okay, now we're talking about what you call counterfactual statements. So let's say, hypothetically, here's a counterfactual statement. If Eric is rich, then he would buy a Mercedes. If Eric is not rich, then he would buy the car that I have outside. <laughs> well, I'm not rich, so I have the car that I have outside. But if I were rich, I would have done this. So a counterfactual doesn't show that there's no free will. If anything, it shows the opposite. It shows if this, then that. But in the end, they are still my free choice. Did God create the universe knowing whether or not you'd be rich? Sure, but what does his knowledge have to do with my free will? Because if he, ch if he chose to create this universe as opposed to another one that gave you different opportunities, no, okay, again, you're, you're, you're begging the question. You're assuming there is no free will. If there's free will, I'm not, I'm regardless of what universe God created, it is still up to me to do whatever it is in whichever universe I find myself. I'm only pointing out that under one particular God model, which you may not adhere to, there definitely is no free will. And that is the God model where God created everything, could have created it differently, right, and chose to create it this way knowing what would happen. Right, okay. There is no free will in that universe. Let, let, let me, okay. If there was only one door to go out of today, it would not follow that I am forced to go out of that door. I can not go out of any door. So again, you're begging the question that just because there's one door, the universe that we're talking about, then I'm, I have to walk through that door. No, God knows whether you're going out the door or not. And what, right? again, yeah, sure. So if God knows you're going out the door, is there anything you can do to not go out the door? Yeah, I, he only knows you because of what do I'm going to do. That you can do something to get Wait, God wrong? Which is what I'm trying to go to. Okay, let me, let me tell you exactly what I was saying in the beginning. You're asking about fatalism, which is what I was about to address. Okay. Say at my daughter's next birthday party, I record everything. And then the next day I talk to someone who wasn't able to go and I said, well, let me show you the video. Now, I know infallibly what happened on the video, but at the timing of that video being recorded, everything was done freely. Yep. Now, me knowing and the video already having what happened, does not in any way insinuate that what happened in the video was determined to happen and could not have done otherwise. Just yeah, because I know you didn't it. create the circumstances of that video. This it, is it, where it, the that, analogy now, fails no, with the You're God. arguing the analogy, not the point. Again, if I know if it, I know what it. happens in the video, it doesn't mean that the video is determined to happen. While I recorded it, it was freely done. You're familiar with Craig. He gives the example of the infallible barometer, uh, where he says, "Say you have a, a barometer that knows the weather tomorrow." Well, the, the barometer doesn't make the weather happen. It, it predicts it, what's going to happen. And of course, if it's infallible in God's omniscience, then it can't be wrong. Now, if the weather were different tomorrow, then the barometer's prediction would have been different. But whatever the weather is tomorrow is what makes the barometer, gives it the prediction that it is. So God knows what I'm going to do tomorrow, but that doesn't cause my actions. I didn't say that. That's Once what you again, want? Okay. No. Clarify, please. I, this, I specifically went to three prongs, which I'm going to move on after this, that there was a creation, knowing what would happen, and with the opportunity to create a different universe with a different outcome. Right. Your example of the videotape is you're watching it from outside. This is the common response that God is outside of space and time, sees it like a videotape. Sees well, I don't it, think God's outside it. of time, but... Okay. Watching a videotape is outside of the timeline of the events that took place. A videotape's never going to change, right. and you can know what happens. The difference sure. between you filming something and you intentionally creating all of the circumstances within the tape, that's the difference between the video example and God. You're, again, you're assuming there's no free will. If, if I could... When, when I proposed to my wife, I'm not I said everything assuming, no. She I'm still not, could have said no. I'm not assuming there's no free will. I'm pointing out one type of free will that is in conflict with one notion about God. The first common objection to theists who promote contra-causal free will stems from conflating prediction with freedom. Compatibilists will say that if God knows what we're going to choose, then we don't really have free will. But as Eric tried to explain, 
This objection is irrational because predicting something is not the same as causing or determining it. This objection ultimately limits God and assumes that God is unable to make accurate predictions about our future choices. This limit is obviously irrational since God can see the heart and read the mind of his creatures and doesn't have to program them in order to make accurate predictions about their future choices. Matt's objection, however, seems to be a different one. Matt is conflating causality with free will and is assuming that all of our choices depend on the chain of events in the past and the circumstances that surround us today. This objection also limits God and assumes that God cannot have created autonomous creatures with contracausal free will who would be able to make free choices regardless of the chain of events in the past and the circumstances that surround them today or the type of world that they're living in, which is created by God. Furthermore, Matt claims that the only possible solution to his objection is that if someone like him would end up an atheist in all the possible worlds that God could have created. But this is again question begging since it assumes that all of our choices depend on the chain of events in the past and the circumstances that surround us today or the type of world that we're living in and that God cannot have created autonomous creatures with contracausal free will who would be able to make free choices regardless of their past or circumstances. This is not how responsibility works in societies either. For example, we normally don't hold people responsible based on the chain of events in their past or the circumstances that surround them today or the type of world that they're living in. Given Matt's logic, if someone who is born and raised in let's say Saudi Arabia where they behead the unbelievers comes to the US and goes out and starts beheading the unbelievers, the US citizens should excuse his actions based on his upbringing. While it may be true that if such a person was born and raised in the US, he would likely not be the person he is today, there is no way to guarantee such speculation, especially given similar actions carried out by people who have been born and raised in the US. What if God, in his wisdom and knowledge, has created a world in which anyone who would freely come to know him and find salvation in all of the possible worlds that God could have created would indeed freely come to know him and find salvation. What if Matt would end up an atheist in all the possible worlds that God could have created? Can he still try to blame God for his unbelief? Maybe. After all, at the end of the day, the unbelievers like Matt who are suppressing the truth in unrighteousness are going to seek to blame everything on God so they can justify their unbelief. But one day will come when they can't suppress the truth any longer and on that day they won't be able to even attempt to blame God for anything. It will be like calling the truth a lie. Thanks for watching.